Uh, welcome to MEI. My name is Phil Wilcox. I'm a one of uh, MEI's many um, MEI scholars. I'm the former president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace, and I know many of you. So uh, it's good to see you all today. I know the memory of the horrible crisis in Gaza uh, last summer is still fresh in our minds, and I hope it's in in the minds of others too, because here is a moment following that disaster which killed over 2,000 Palestinians, many of them non-combatants, many of them women and children, and left 100,000 Gazans without homes. Really ought to be a catalyst for a decisive change. Uh, for too long, Gaza has been divided uh, Gaza has been subject to a very, very tough closure. Uh, and those two things have thwarted real economic development. Uh, they've also thwarted Palestinian reunification, I think. So the war ought to be a wake-up call for everyone. Uh, one of the bright spots, uh, and there are not many, is that uh, an era America's most experienced um, NGO development institution that has been working in the West Bank and Gaza for many, many years has, as usual, stepped up to the challenge. And we're lucky today to have two uh, of the nearest leaders with us. Uh, Rania El Hilhu is the director of communications for Anera in Gaza. And uh, she's here to tell us about the situation on the ground. Uh, Paul Butler is the country director for Palestine in the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, and in addition to the horrible burdens that, Ga that Anera and the Gazan people are bearing now, Anera uh, uh, also has a major program of development humanitarian assistance in the West Bank. So thank you for coming. It's a great time to have you here. Uh, which one of you would like to lead off? Uh, oh, Rania, please. Our speakers will, will take a few minutes, but we'll have lots of time for questions and comments. So. Thank you, Rania. You're welcome. Uh, hello, everybody. And uh, it's just great to be here. And thank you for coming. Uh, it's just nice to be back in the States. I was here in 2012, uh, just before the war of 2012, and now I'm back in 2014, after the war of 2014. Um, and uh, you probably have seen my face already on Anera website. I've been sending daily reports about life uh, in Gaza under the bombings. Uh, it's, uh, it has been uh, on our website throughout the 51 days of bombing. And uh, let me just tell you that the pa this past summer was tr truly a scary time for all of us in Gaza. And it was uh, very hard for the children to absorb what was happening around them. And um, uh, at some point, it was not even safe for my family to, to be in their place. So they all come over to stay with us. And uh, we decided all just to you know, sit shoulder by shoulder shoulder to shoulder and just face whatever is, uh, uh, is coming. It was so hard and uh, so terrible. And um, it was just great to, to know that there are so many people caring and uh, they, they read about Gaza and want to do more help to, to Gaza. And um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a mother of two children, and it's, it's, it's always hard when, you, when the children saw you keeping some suitcases by the door, packed with the emergency stuff, uh, ready to flee at any time. And, uh, you know, it's very hard to keep handling uh, the, the huge amount of, of questions that comes up. Where are we going? Why we are just what we are waiting for? It was really a very hard time. And... Um, I have to tell you that even while the bombs were falling on us, our in-kind team 
Staff managed to keep supplies of medicines flowing to hospitals that needed them desperately. And we were able to do a lot of emergency relief in Gaza. We provided food parcels. Uh, we uh, provided hygiene kits and dignity kits to, to women. Uh, and uh, we supported a lot of facilities uh, with the fuel so they can, uh, the, these facilities produce more water. And I have to tell you that one of the things that make me proud when during the distribution of the, the kits to families who evacuated in shelters, when we start distributing women dignity kits, uh, because when women uh, just evacuated their homes, they, they give a priority to items of their children and their uh, families, family items, and they totally forget themselves. And by the, by the end, they found themselves just in the shelters with nothing. So when Anera came to those shelters and provided them with uh, those dignity kits that, is, that include both hygiene items and clothing items, we restored a bit of, uh, of their dignity, and they were so thankful of that. We also, my, my colleagues also in Gaza, risked their lives to distribute food to families living in shelter. They, um, th we also set up water tanks, around 87 water tanks all around Gaza. And we had five uh, water trucks going all around the city from the north to the south, distributing water and filling tanks uh, because people were just desperate for water. And living there was just hard, you know, when you wake up in the morning if you sleep in the night, you just wake up and find yourself, you know, without electricity, without water, running out of food. The stores are just um, depleting, and there is no uh, no f supplies in the local markets. So it was nice uh, to to be there and support families and people with the drinking water. And as soon as there was a ceasefire, everyone from our office got out to distribute again more food parcels and water supplies to displaced families and shelters. And um, it's, it's nice to continue that support to those families. Uh, when I left last week, when I left Gaza, uh, the m many families were still living in those shelters. Uh, they, they were not just able to go back to their homes because the, the homes are destroyed. And people don't want to go and live back in tents. We don't want to go to 1948 and, you know, just live in tents. And uh, th the winter time is coming and the cold weather is really around the corner. And can you imagine how many families now, you know, are just, you know, uh, welcoming the winter with, uh, with no winter clothes and with, with no homes? Uh, it's it's been really hard, and um, uh, but the good part I think before we left, we had this project uh, to uh, give uh, uh, like clothing vouchers to families so they can go to some stores and uh, pick up you know coat uh, or uh, some clothing items so they can keep their children warm during the coming winter. I hope we can do more and more projects to support those families. And uh, I always consider myself lucky to be able to, uh, to cross all the checkpoints and all the borders and uh, to be here in the States and to share my experience with you. Uh, my story is only one of many, many stories over there. I'm just lucky, you know, to be here and um, to see all, uh, all of you and share my story. Uh, I would like just to end by saying that people in Gaza now are not focused about politics, they are not focused about, you know, any things we're hearing in the news, because once you, you're living there, the real experience, you're really focused about your family, providing and supporting your children, and uh, we are just focused day-to-day -day life. I wish, I wish we can go over this crisis and we can do more development work. We, we want to do more development work. We want to develop. We want to have more uh, successful, sustainable projects. Uh, I believe in that. And I'm sure with people like you, we will go to the right path. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Rania. Um, yeah, while Rania was speaking, I was reflecting back on what I told the MEI audience uh, last year, because I was here in October, 
2013. And at that time, actually, Gaza was having a, a small construction boom. Um, you know, thousands of tons of construction materials were coming in uh, through tunnels in Egypt. Uh, there was a lot of construction going on. Uh, there was a con small consumer boom. And, uh, you know, there was hope that, uh, you know, the light was at the end of the tunnel and uh, people were optimistic and building large houses and, uh, you know, the uh, cutteries were building, uh, you know, the north-south uh, uh, road project, which was a $450 million project. Um, and, you know, the situation was, uh, was, was still, you know, relatively tense, but, uh, you know, things were, things were coming through and, and uh, people were actually thinking that, uh, you know, I mean, things could drastically improve. Um, after, the, after this war, after the 2014 war, I mean, I would say that Gaza's probably been thrown back at least uh, 20 years, if not more. Um, just to give you an idea of the scale of uh, destruction that, that took place in uh, Cass Lead, which was in 2009, uh, 600,000 tons of rubble were you know, produced or measured after the war and were removed, um, you know, during the, the rehabilitation process. The amount of rubble estimated now to be present in Gaza is three million tons. So, you know, the, the scale of difference between uh, protective edge and cast lead uh, is, is, is dramatic. And when I first went back into Gaza during the first ceasefire, you know, I, I asked everyone, I asked the staff, I asked Rania, you know, uh, what's your, you know, what's your reaction? How does this compare to, to, to Cast Lead? And immediately it was, this is totally different. I mean, in Cast Lead, uh, there was, you know, targeted destruction of government buildings, uh, military facilities, and um, I mean, while there were civilian casualties, I mean, the day-to-day the, the -day life sort of continued. I mean, in between, you know, pauses in the, in the military operations. And um, our uh, logistics uh, driver mentioned to me, I mean, now no one was safe in Gaza. I mean, we never knew when the attacks were going to come. Most of the, dis most of the military operations entailed uh, artillery fire, you know, from the land and, and sea. And with the Israeli ground incursion, you know, that went all along the border up to, you know, three to four kilometers, uh, you know, from Beit Hanun to, to Rafah, um, you know, half a million people were, uh, were displaced. Um, an image that continues to, to haunt me um, was when I accompanied one of our water delivery trucks on the, you know, the first ceasefire. And we went to uh, Shajaiya, which is on the, in the border area, one of the most, uh, you know, uh, areas that suffered the most destruction. And, you know, we were supposed to go one kilometer to one of our distribution tanks and distribute water there. Well, we got as far as maybe a um, hundred yards, and people just came out of the rubble uh, with uh, bricks and uh, and pieces of, of of wood and clubs, not to harm us, but just to stop our truck. And you know, we had ten cubic uh, meters of water, and you know, I just said, you know, now now it's water distribution day, so. <laughs> Everyone, you know, who was able to carry a container, I mean, you know, children literally have, you know, five cups. I mean, they were so desperate for water because uh, those areas had no access. There was no potable water. And I mean, you, you know, I've uh, worked in many conflict zones, but, you know, I was just struck with when people lack water, you know, your eyes sort of turn a different color of red, you know, it's sort of a pinkish red color when you're really dehydrated and um, they, they, were, they, they were desperate. Um, 
and uh, you know private conversations I had on you know in, in eras with the uh, Israelis, uh, Israeli military officials, um, they, they, uh, I mean, they didn't admit, you know, that they went over the top, but I mean, there was no, you know, when I was sort of, I had to brief them on what I had seen and what our operations were, because, you know, we have to coordinate with them, you know, they, uh, didn't say anything, you know, they were sort of, you know, I mean, they were sort of silent acknowledgement that, uh, that was the situation. Um, another striking thing. So you know, I went into I went into Gaza with every ceasefire, and then the you know the long term ceasefire happened at the end of August. Um, and I went in with I took the Anira president Bill Corcoran in, and we were both struck with one thing. I mean, this was I'd have to say this was the first conflict I had been to where there's a long-term ceasefire where I don't see any construction activity going on. I mean, when I was in Afghanistan, in Kosovo, in Iraq, uh, you know, in Sarajevo, after Dayton, immediately after a long-term ceasefire, families go out with bags of cement, construction materials, and start to rebuild. I mean, they don't wait you know, when you're desperate to put a roof over your head, you don't wait for an international aid organization um, to come in and start rebuilding. You rebuild yourself. And, you know, Gazans are intrepid uh, construction workers. They know how to rebuild. But there's no construction materials available inside Gaza. So what's going on here? So you have a long-term ceasefire. Um, in theory... You have a unity government between uh, Fatah and, and Hamas, uh, which was never, you know, it was announced in April of, uh, of this year, but it was never allowed to even get off of the ground by, uh, by, by the government of Israel. I mean, despite the fact of tacit recognition, even by the United States. I mean, all sort of the international community recognized the, uh, the unity government as, as, uh, as functional and, you know, worthy to, you know, as an entity to, to, to work with. Um, so what's happening right now is um, there are still severe restrictions on the importation of construction materials. The situation in the Egyptian border, I mean, there's no materials coming in. Most of the tunnels have now been, you know, shut down. So, I mean, there might be a trickle of things coming in through Egypt. And I mean, I, one of the things I did, I did an informal survey. I just went out with our staff and said, you know, I want to look for bags of cement. So take me to every place where you think, you know, I could find cement uh, or construction materials to purchase. And, you know, I would see maybe 20 bags here, 30 bags there. And then they told me, oh, you know, Paul, uh, we shouldn't be buying large quantities of cement on the local market because Hamas has arrested people who have been hoarding cement. So, you know, we have to be very, very careful. Um, the regime that exists right now inside Gaza, we, I mean, basically works as follows. Um, everything has to be imported uh, through uh, Kogat, which is the Israeli coordination body to bring materials into Gaza. And uh, the government of Israel has um, uh, requested that each entity, you know, like ANIRA or UNRWA or any, and, you know, any development organization that wants to do work inside of, reconstruction work inside of Gaza, has to, si has to sign a framework for sort of defining the, uh, the parameters of uh, how to bring materials in. And there's been several, there's been several, you know, private Palestinian companies that have signed a framework with Kogat. The Palestinian Authority has signed uh, a framework, and UNRWA has signed a framework. But the way it basically works, though, just to give you, you know, it's a very detailed uh, list of conditions. But number one, government of Israel has to approve every project. So it's not just like, you know, where it was in the past where a donor would 
say, you know, we work with USAID, and they would say, okay, Anira has approval to build uh, this 500 cubic meter water tank, which was a project that we, we built uh, and completed in, in Gaza uh, three years ago. Um, doesn't work that way anymore. So government of Israel, each individual project has to be approved by them. Number two, your list of contractors, local contractors inside of Gaza has to be reviewed by the government of Israel. They have, a, they have a right to ask for all of your staff who are working on the project and all the staff of the contractors working on the project, and they can request all the IDs of those people. So, I don't know, I mean, in, so if, you know, Rania were to go to that project, I might have to give, you know, be requested, well, you know, you have to give all of her personal information uh, to us uh, before we, you know, allow this project uh, to work or to continue. Um, all the construction materials have to be carefully reviewed by, by COGOT. Um, all of the construction materials then going in have to be guarded uh, in a central facility inside Gaza and guarded, you know, day and night. I mean, I mean, and that I don't have an issue with, but the other thing was is that, you know, in case of any loss or diversion of materials, I mean, they can hold each entity legally and personally liable. And the way we had, the way Anira had worked, and Anira has implemented since it was founded. I mean, it was founded in 1968, and our Gaza office has been operational since 1985. And I could say we, you know, a conservative estimate would be since that time we've provided, you know, well over 150 million dollars worth of assistance inside Gaza. I mean, in medical in kind. Uh, constructing, you know, schools, hospitals, roads, um, greenhouses, uh, etc. And, you know, I mean, in our case, we've ne we never had any issue with, you know, we would coordinate with the Israelis to bring construction materials in. None of our materials were ever diverted, but we never had this sort of heavy-handed sort of supervision on their part. Um, so, you know, the, the talk on the street inside Gaza is, okay, you know, how are we going to deal with this? And, and it is open for negotiation, so, I mean, don't get me, don't let me give you the wrong impression. I mean, this was, this was the framework that was signed with the UN, I mean, with all of these steps. Um, so that's going to take a lot of time. So, I mean, we received a draft and we've given back comments and we want U.S., you know, we want our donors to sort of get involved as well in the discussion. But, you know, meanwhile, as Rania was saying, uh, people are getting angry, people are getting desperate. Um, you know, it, it, there were heavy rains in Gaza last week and people in temporary housing were flooded out and... Uh, you know, the UN under their, UNRWA in particular, under this current framework, has been able to bring in, in the first month, 600 tons of materials. But, you know, their estimates indicate that they need to bring in 2,000 tons every month for their five-year project horizon to address the, just the housing issue. You know, they were about 20,000 housing units that were completely destroyed and another 50,000 that were partially destroyed that need, you know, significant um, rehabilitation work. So, meanwhile, so, you know, a trickle is coming in uh, through the UN and, you know, other agencies are sort of, you know, left without being able to, to uh, work inside Gaza and, um, you know, it's, People are, uh, people are getting angry. People are angry at uh, the Palestinian Authority. I mean, there's this unity government, but, you know, I mean, Gazans that I speak, to, uh, speak with will say, you know, why hasn't President Abbas visited Gaza? And I think that's a, that's a legitimate question. Um, you know, when, uh, how are we going to deal with the winter? I mean, how, uh, how am I going to keep my children, uh, warm? So, you know, all of these questions are starting to come to, uh, 
to fruition. Um, and, you know, to, to conclude, um, I realize, you know, I mean, as, uh, you know, one of the lead agencies working in Gaza and the West Bank, that there's a large amount of donor fatigue. Because, I mean, this is, well, you know, since the second Intifada, this is the, the third war. And, you know, I mean, the scale of destruction of this one was just, you know, I mean, took people's breath away. Um, you know, conservative estimates to get Gaza back to where it was 20 years ago is like in the multi-billion dollar range. It's like five billion or six billion dollars. Um, so, you know, people ask themselves inside Gaza, is this going to be the, is, you know, we hope this is the last time because I uh, seriously, um, I think, you know, if something isn't done to uh, address the long-term solution, it's going to become, uh, you know, the potential uh, for, you know, Gaza becoming really, you know, descending into what, you know, happened in, uh, you know, in Somalia, for example, is, is, is very real. So anyway, thank you very much. I can open it now for questions. Thank you, Ronnie and Paul. Uh, I'm sure you have many questions. If you could identify yourself, I know our guests would be pleased to answer them. Uh, I have a question. With many international organizations working hard in Gaza, uh, is the, the new unity government able to serve as a coordinator, as a center for activity, or have the organizations been able to create their own informal coordination process, and how does it work? <coughs> so in theory, there's a unity government that was announced in April. And just prior to the war, I mean, the plan was that government officials from the West Bank would move to, uh, to Gaza to work with their Gazan colleagues and some Gazans were going to come and work in the, in the West Bank. And I mean, that was in late June and you know, the war started at the beginning of July and it never, it never got off of the ground. So to speak of, a, of an operational unity government is, uh, you know, it doesn't exist. So um, I don't know what, Uh, we basically coordinate all uh, the emergency activities uh, uh, on the ground with the UN. So UN is the big umbrella under which all of us as a humanitarian bodies uh, work with and coordinate our activities. Uh, for one reason, to make sure that our deliveries uh, d is uh, being delivered to people in need. Second, to avoid any duplications. So UN is usually the, the one that we go for for this type of activities. They've been running different uh, clusters. Each cluster is uh, uh, specialized in certain themes, agriculture, uh, food, uh, hygiene. So we, we're, we've been directed to report to each cluster constantly to make sure that our assistance delivered and coordinated very well. Right, and that's for the emergency assistance. Now for construction uh, projects, the Palestinian Authority does want to get involved in that. And there's a private mechanism that they've put forth. So if it's not, uh, so let's say if, you know, if an entity like ANIRA comes with its own private money and say, you know, we want to, you know, uh, rehabilitate Al-Akhli Hospital, for example. So we don't have a specific donor like USAID that can come and help us, uh, you know, with the with the government of Israel. Well, the Palestinian Authority and the and the government of Israel have signed a framework to do projects. So that that would entail then going through ministries in Ramallah to do work in Gaza. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, just dealing with West Bank projects. The ministries in Ramallah are backlogged. I mean, because, you know, an era we do millions of dollars of projects in the West Bank, and we have to work through the Palestinian Authority line ministries. So, I mean, it begs the question, does the Palestinian Authority have the capacity to 
do this, you know, engage and implement this extra work, which, you know, you know so we're talking about a multi-billion dollar reconstruction effort in Gaza that will take years and years. And, you know, I would put a big question mark uh, on that. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm meeting with uh, Palestinian Ambassador Arakat uh, tomorrow, and that's going to be a question I'm going to ask him. So, Phil, to answer your question, um, I mean, there are informal mechanisms, but as we move more from emergency to reconstruction, it's going to be more centralized. And, you know, so one is, you know, to work directly with GOI, and trying to get things in, and the other one is to work with the Palestinian <coughs> Authority, but that's also working through GOI, Government of Israel. So at the end, you know, the focal point is really going to be, you know, your ability to navigate through all the procedures that um, uh, Kogat, Government of Israel, will, 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 you know, put in front of you. Yes, mm -hmm. it's Thank you very much. My name is Justyna Bartkiewicz. I'm with the Polish Embassy here in DC. I have a question uh, about the needs that you talked. They are obviously enormous and uh, on all fronts, but if you can maybe talk a little bit more about if you would like to try to prioritize for the purpose of international community uh, assistance. Uh, just recently was the conference on Gaza in Cairo and my country was there also represented. I would be interested to hear more from, from the ground to how you see the needs, if you would like to prioritize them so that I can also take it back to my government and report properly. Thank yeah, you. I can start off and then, you know, Rania, you can give some of your reflections, but I would say, you know, rehousing the uh, IDPs, the inter internally displaced persons inside of Gaza. So having, you know, a quick, sustained and appropriate uh, housing reconstruction. Uh, effort because you know we're dealing with 250,000 uh, people, so that's about uh, uh, you know population of Gaza is like 1.8 uh, million. That's uh, you know like 15 percent of the population. Um, so that's one. Um, the other one is getting the you know electricity plant you know back and running and you know increasing its capacity so it was damaged it was damaged heavily in the war at first they said well only the fuel tanks were damaged but actually the facility itself was damaged so there's no uh electricity yeah. now in gaza whatsoever um the other pr and then water sanitation um you know, we're providing fuel to these desalination plants run by the Coastal Management Water Utility, CMWU, which is a semi-governmental entity associated with the Palestinian Water Authority. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the needs are, are tremendous. People, you know, the water networks were destroyed and damaged. So, you know, people turn on the tap and there's no, there's no water uh, still. Um, yeah, I, I do agree with yeah. you. I mean, basically, reconstruction is uh, uh, one of the basic needs now, um, of course, for rehousing, also for rebuilding of other uh, infrastructure like preschools and hospitals that were damaged also during the war. And uh, also electricity, it's now a major, uh, major problem. Uh, I remember visiting the, um, uh, uh, the, the Gaza power plant just uh, one week before I arrived to the States, and I saw the damages with my own eyes. And uh, the responsible official there, he said that it, it, it needs tremendous work to, to get it uh, operating again, plus, uh, the, the main feed, feeding lines were really hit, so those ones need to be fixed, and the, the repair work, work would take uh, a year, you know, just to do the repair work for the, the main two feeding lines for the power plant. Yeah, so basically those are the two major things. Yeah, the I mean, the situation is so desperate that even the government of Israel agreed to, uh, Turkey um, proposed that they could, you know, they have a, a ship with a big generators on them and just to park the ship off the coast of Gaza and, yeah. and hook it up. I mean, it hasn't happened yet because, I mean, a lot of it's because of these feeder lines. I mean, it, you know, it's not enough just to bring a 
portable generator in and you know it's not like you know you get a wire a cable and you oh yeah. you know gaza has power yeah i mean all the you know and the same with the water i mean the electric electrical networks are all down and you have to go individually block by block and repair them and the same with the water networks yeah and uh, to um, uh, the gaza power plant needs around 400,000 liters of fuel per day for operation and that's another challenge if even you get the big engines you still need the, the amount of fuel to operate them yes, if the supply of fuel been resumed or will it be when the plant is ready to operate um yeah, I think there's still, I mean, the, the thing about the fuel is um, it's getting, you know, the right permission to bring it in. I mean, we bring in uh, fuel uh, to uh, CMWU, you know, the, the water utility for their desalination plants. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that took like f four, a four-week approval process just for us to do that. I mean, and that's just for, uh, you know. Uh, for desalination plants, I mean the the f the to to provide fuel for the power plant will be at a much much larger scale. Um, that needs the <clears throat> Palestinian Authority or like a yeah. governmental entity to in right. to provide this huge amount of fuel. Yeah. Sir, in the third row, second row. <laughs> Hi, I'm <clears throat> Brian Barber from New America here in D.C. and the University of Tennessee. Thanks first both for coming. Paul, in your answer to Phil's question about the m mechanisms for getting aid, first emergency, then reconstruction into Gaza, you mentioned the government of Israel and you mentioned the Palestinian Authority. You didn't mention the Hamas government. And I wondered if you'd clarify for us the degree to which Hamas is explicitly a player in these arrangements or if not the degree to which they're insisting upon being a player and how you feel about all that yeah i mean they're still definitely a player i mean they have uh, operational control over uh gaza so in theory you were supposed to have this unity government to be you know put in place that would um and you know hamas would sort of step aside and let the unity ministers and government officials you know take over operations i mean the fact of the matter is um you know they still you know they run the the police they have you know uh they still have a sizable arsenal and military forces their own you know paramilitary forces um and uh they're the ones who control everything so. including these arrangements for getting materials in you know, in th so far, I mean, they haven't interfered with the UN, you know, getting the materials in. <clears throat> During our projects, they never interfered either as well. So, I mean, if, that's, if that modus operandi is going to continue to operate, then, you know, I mean, it will be fine. But that was, when that was happening, they had, you know, that was when I gave my talk last year when you had, you know, uh, uh, thousands of tons of cement coming in through Egypt in the tunnels and you know probably I mean uh, and, and I think it's true I mean a lot of materials were also diverted from the Qatari uh, road project you know 450 million dollar road project so they didn't need to bother us I mean they had uh, enough stuff you know enough gravy you know coming their way um, now in this case so if you have this very strict regime of construction projects, you know, occurring, but they're not getting anything, you know, uh, from Egypt or through the tunnels. Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, they could come and start uh, coming around and saying, oh, you know, we, you know, uh, we want to siphon off 5% uh, of your construction materials or more. So it's a definite possibility. <clears throat> Thank you. Leander Bernstein, RIA Novosti. I'd just like you to clarify a little bit more on the, the challenges with reconstruction, because what I hear you saying is construction material is not coming in. Right. The government of Israel has uh, these, uh, these arrangements under the United Nations 
uh, reconstruction e e under UNRA. Right. Uh, and and everything's basically slowed down to a trickle. I'm I'm just a little bit. So the the materials aren't coming in, or it's the no, the, the delay is a result. The materials of are coming in, but you know when you have to stop. I mean, let's say I mean just look. <laughs> At this room, for example, and all the things that go into the construction here, there's probably about 150 different items that would, you know, a contractor would have to outline in his bill of quantity as to like, okay, you know, this is what I need to build this room. Now, multiply that by thousands, you know, because, you know, you're bringing in materials to rebuild thousands of homes. Uh, and all of that has to be checked and verified in each truck and counted and recounted and verified and re-verified. And if there's one tile missing from the truck, the truck goes back. They don't allow the truck to go through. Or if there's a tile extra, if, you know, if, if the project was, you know, requires 500 bags of cement and there's 501, the truck goes back. And then, very simple question: Can you explain the rationale for that? The rationale for that is, I mean, from the Israeli perspective, you know, obviously with the the network of tunnels that they discovered, you know, they don't want that to happen again. So, I mean, that's the giving you the government of Israel's uh, perspective. Um, I mean, having said that, I mean, is that the only way you can ensure that that doesn't uh, happen again? I mean, I think that's a open question. I mean, does the does the framework and the requirements, uh, you know, is it necessary to have that those you know draconian policies in order to prevent uh, leakage and you know into the market? So I think that's you know that's a question that the international community. And the Israelis need to ask themselves because, you know, I mean, with that regime of having to, you know, go through everything it's so meticulously, and even at the construction site, once the material is in, it also has to be recounted. So the UN has an army of monitors that go out to each project and they go, okay, there's the first bag of cement, second bag of cement, and, you know, they have to measure. So, you know, this slab, you know, did, was there any possible leakage from creating this slab? Uh, did it, you know, did we need two bags of cement or was it 1.75? And then what happened to the other 0.25 uh, bag of cement? So you go through that and, you know, they have to do, they have to do 70 houses, housing units under that regime. I mean, it's going to take a long time. Penny? Hi, Penelope Mitchell with the Palestinian American Research Center. Um, three sort of comments, questions. One, it makes no sense to me that draconian measures like these would help avert bringing materials in through tunnels. In fact, it would seem to be just the opposite. People are desperate. They need to build houses. They need materials yeah. to put a roof over their head. Yeah. So that's one. Two, what are the international agencies, including the UN, including ANIRA, doing to try and change these draconian measures? And three, we also read snippets here and there about Israelis profiting from the rebuilding of Gaza, about Israeli yeah. materials. And this is completely unconscionable. The, you know, that you go get American money to bomb someplace and then you get paid to supply the materials to rebuild it. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, like your third point, absolutely. I mean, uh, Israeli suppliers of cement and construction materials have, it's been, you know, the aid business has been a boom to them. I mean, in Gaza and the West Bank. Um, so that's, uh, that's definitely a legitimate question. Um, I mean, what the, you know, what the UN and agencies like ANIRA can do. I mean, we're sort of in a, I mean, speaking on behalf of, of, of ANIRA, we're in a difficult situation because, you know, we're, well, we're registered with the Palestinian Authority, and then we're also registered uh, with the Ministry of Social Affairs in, 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 in Israel. 
And, uh, you know, since 1968, I mean, the main activities that Anira has been doing is economic development, health, agriculture, education, you know, uh, broad stroke uh, development projects. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we would have to measure that. I mean, you know, sort of vocally expressing um, uh, disappointment with that regime instead of trying to work through it, I mean, or rejecting yeah. it, saying, you know, hell no, we won't sign or we won't cooperate. I mean, it would be, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, the repercussions from that, especially with this Israeli government, which is the most right-wing uh, government in Israel's history, I would say. I mean, with, you know, coalition partners like uh, uh, Habayat, uh, Hayahudi with uh, Bennett and, uh, you know, uh, Lieberman's party. Um, you know, it, 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 it uh, you know, it could make life very difficult, you know, for international agencies. So, I mean, do you just protest and say we're not signing this and leave? And, you know, I don't know. I mean, that's a, that's, that's a, that's a huge uh, moral uh, dilemma. Um, I know, I mean, some people say, well, you know, just let the Israelis reoccupy Gaza. You know, they destroyed it, they invaded it, so let's bring back, you know, 1967 again. I don't know. I mean, I, you know, as a country director of Anira, I just, you know, try to, you know, work with the communities that we work with and improve their lives, I mean, through our, yeah. through our projects. And um, I think, you know, that question is more directed at, you know, this government here in this country and uh, the international donor community. Yeah. And um, from my experience working over there also, an era usually uh, focus more in humanitarian work. We don't do a lot of advocacy work, but participating in other meetings where other organizations like um, Oxfam, for example, they have some uh, some advocacy groups. They go speak to embassies and they travel around and uh, they um, write down some policies. We endorse them as an era, but we could we couldn't do the advocacy work uh, by ourselves. But we give endorsement. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Partly, at least. <laughs> yes, ma'am. My name is Tamara Esiad, uh, I'm an attorney. Uh, so I think we've delicately bounced around the idea of ethnically cleansing uh, the Gazan people. Uh, and Penny brought up a really great point uh, in terms of these draconian policies, but, and I understand the great humanitarian work that you do, but are you, in signing these agreements with the Israelis, getting any assurances that once you do start rebuilding, that they're not gonna come back and level the Palestinians once more? Well, w one thing to be clear, and I can say this, I mean, we, I would be very reluctant to sign a one-on-one -on -one framework with, I mean, I would want to have a framework to bring things in through, like USAID, for example, which is our main, I mean, that, and that's how we've been able to operate very effectively in Gaza and, and you know, doing all of these projects. Um, or if, or the Palestinian Authority. I mean, if they were, if they had the capacity and they were functional. So, I mean, I, you know, wouldn't want to, and, and I would be very reluctant to provide, you know, a lot of these things if they asked for them. I mean, uh, identity cards and private information of people and, even though I, they probably have them anyway, you know, in their in their databases. But uh, you know, it's a fine line. I mean, between working with um, a government and being complicit in what they what that government is trying to do to, you know, uh, Gaza, for example, and and uh, the, the Palestinians in general. Um, so it's. Uh, um, well, it's a very it's, it, it's a very difficult question, but I mean, for Anira itself, I mean, we haven't signed anything yet. I mean, it's still under discussion and negotiations. But you know, our position is we don't want to be complicit in doing uh, GOI's dirty work. Yeah. As straight as that. I mean, you know, um, I mean, Rania can speak. Uh, I mean, we protect our staff and their uh, their security and uh, you know we wouldn't allow we wouldn't want uh, that to be compromised or jeopardized in any way yes, 
my name is Sajjad. I'm from Bangladesh. I'm an author of war crimes and um, genocide, actually. So I want to tell one thing, that um, when you murder one or two people, it's called as crime and murder. But when you kill thousands, it becomes a statistics, actually. That's what we're all talking about now. How many people died and all that, unfortunate. I'm more concerned about the children of Israel who are being forced to become men without time. And these children are going to lead Israel, are, are going to lead the Palestinian people within some time. So when you're reconstructing the buildings of Gaza, are you thinking of engaging these children and engaging their hearts and minds so that they don't become violent anymore? Thank you, sir. Well, we, Anira has a very large, we call it our early childhood development program. Uh, where we, you know, uh, train, uh, we, we create sort of modern um, preschools and kindergartens. I mean, the, unfortunately, the emphasis traditionally and historically in, in Palestinian education has been in the higher education area. So secondary school, universities, and as you move down, I mean, kindergartens and preschools, I mean, the government-run ones, they just turn on a television and just let the kids just sort of sit there or they don't exist. I mean, there's no uh, curriculum actually for uh, uh, teaching, you know, three, four, five-year-olds. I mean, so, you know, we've been working with, uh, you know, private or, you know, uh, community-based organizations uh, to inculcate sort of modern methods and pedagogical uh, techniques on, uh, you know, modern preschool. But I mean, that's a small program. I mean, our program to date has been about $3 million and it needs to be a national program um, in, uh, in Palestine. I mean, the flip side of that, I would say, is also how, you know, young children are inculcated into, you know, having negative stereotypes about uh, Palestinians in, inside Israel. And, you know, I've been going in and out of, of Palestine since 1985. And it's kind of, kind of you know, betraying my uh, age a little bit here. But, uh, you know, I did an internship up in the Galilee in the late 1980s. And, you know, I mean, my first sort of, when I came back to Jerusalem this time in, uh, with Anira in, in uh, 2011, I mean, I was just struck with the lack of any sort of meaningful day-to-day -day contact between Israelis and Palestinians. I mean, it's, you know, and after this war, I mean, it's even less. I mean, um, you know, our, our colleagues in, uh, who live in Jerusalem, for example, I mean, they don't go to West Jerusalem anymore because they can get harassed. Or, you know, if they go to an Israeli area, you know, they kind of whisper to each other in Arabic. And, uh, you know, I, w when I've been going in and out of Gaza, I mean, I almost had my vehicle stoned in uh, Yad Mordecai, which is the Israeli kibbutz just outside of Gaza before you go into Eris. I mean, pe you know, cause people know that you're an international aid worker and there are lots of hostility. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, your question is, is, is legitimate, but it's, you know, it's also on all sides. I yeah. mean, because children are used as uh, as pawns in this conflict, and you know, brainwashed, and um, and yeah. I mean, on the on the Israeli side, there's just as much uh, incitement, and and uh, you know, through the education system that creates uh, enmity and distrust and and hatred of uh, Palestinians. Yeah. Well, I think um, this kind of uh, programs that break stereotypes that need to be done and uh, uh, supported by bigger entities other than uh, an era, because you're talking here about education exchange programs through universities, for example. I mean, if, if they get to, uh, to bring uh, Palestinians and Israelis together at the universities or something, it's, it's bigger, bigger programs. But basically, ANERA focuses on children and providing them support at the preschools, creating uh, friendly environments, uh, creating reading corners for them. So I, I think just this kind of 
breaking the stereotypes needs a lot bigger intervention on national levels. Yeah, and here's some, you know, just an anecdote I'll share with you. Um, you know, I mean, these are all sort of well-meaning, you know, people. So, I mean, peace and tolerance programs are, are great. But, you know, right after the, or right after the first ceasefire, so USAID uh, and other donors, the UN, had this meeting of implementing partners. And they were, you know, also implementing partners, you know, Israeli NGOs were there, Palestinian NGOs, international organizations like ANIRA, Save the Children, CRS, et cetera, et cetera. And there was this one uh, Israeli NGO from Beersheba said, oh, you know, we used to bring children over from Gaza to, you know, play with Israeli children in Beersheba. I mean, I don't know, the reaction was like, you know, I mean, 70,000 homes were destroyed, thousands of people were killed. I mean, is that really what we need right now? I mean, to have children, you know, sort of play ball with each other? I mean, in, you know, or, you know, the, the, the immediate needs are water, electricity, you know, getting a roof over your head. And, you know, the level of, and the level of anger right now is just so much that, you know, I don't know, I mean, I... I mean, again, it was a well-intentioned sort of remark. I mean, from someone who you know believes in peace and tolerance, but you know, you have to you have to you know deal with priorities. So. Well, may I add that, in my experience, the hatred and violence in Gaza is not a product of some inbred uh, character defect or some or lack of education. Uh, primitive society. Gaza, like the West Bank, is not a primitive society. It has one of the highest levels of, they have, highest levels of literacy in the Middle East. Yeah. They are rich in human resources. They have a very extensive school system, supported mainly by the UN, but it's an excellent system yeah. under the circumstances. They have universities, too. Hatred and violence are products of an onerous 48-year occupation. Uh, and it would be a miracle, I think, if suddenly the Palestinian public were to display saintly behavior uh, and that these ugly manifestations of the occupation would not again arise if the occupation I think that's it's all it. very well to have training courses in, in tolerance and uh, mm. yeah. peace building, and there are such courses. Look, the UNRWA school yeah. system yes. has mm. courses in human rights and conflict resolution. Uh, so the larger problem is the problem, and until that's resolved, these these uh, ugly behaviors will continue. People on both sides. People forget. You know, it was just 30 years ago when. You know what? Two hundred thousand Gazans would work inside Israel, and you know, I mean, most older Gazans uh, speak Hebrew. I mean, uh, very well too. Um, but you know, it's it again. It's a telling thing of the, you know, the 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 erosion of that people to people contact is. You know, now I would say it's almost completely non-existent. And along with that, I mean, you've had. Uh, uh, you know, and it's on it's on uh, you know both sides. I mean, Hamas has its has its rhetoric and its program, but then you know this Israeli government, as I said, is the most right wing government in history. And you know, I think that you know the consequences of them having been in power for now, what you know, ten years. I mean, the 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 uh, social media things that happen within Israel that you know concern you know people inside Israel of, you know, where are youth going with all these hateful comments and racist comments about Palestinians and, you know, I'm going to kill a Gazan today, you know, snipers putting things up on their Facebook and, you know, getting 10,000 likes, you know, in one day. So, I mean, it's, these don't come out of a vacuum. I mean, it's years and years of, of policies that, uh, and then the occupation that you know, creates all of this, so. Time for one more question, sir. Hi, Imad of Saimad of the IMD. You know, for the U.S. government funds, we know that USAID has 
Convention Order 21 that prohibits direct contact, direct contact with Hamas. And right. working in uh, Gaza, you must have direct contact with Hamas. Is there any movement to kind of remove that mission order so funds can flow more directly to the... Uh no, I mean, Mission Order 21 is going to stay in place. And I mean, you know, any agency like ours, I mean, we have to abide by Mission Order 21. Um, we don't have direct contact with Hamas. We're allowed indirect contact. And I know this sounds sort of, again, talking about procedures and stuff, but our messenger boy, who's probably like one of the most, uh, Musa, he's one of the most intrepid, sort of clever people in the office. I mean, he navigates his way in an indirect fashion to get our permits and our licenses and anything, any piece of paper that we need from, uh, from Hamas to get our work done. So that's, that's the reality and that will continue to be the reality. So, I mean, unlike other countries where I can go and have meetings with, you know, the mayor, of the main city where we no. work in, I can't do that. No way. <laughs> <laughs> we would be all fired. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Ronnie and Paul, I want to thank you for a very, very vivid and